This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Well, hey, Architectos. Welcome to Business of Architecture TV. And today we have the special privilege of having Al Cross with us. Al is the vice president, is a vice president at PGAV. I am. <laughs> and Al is going to tell us all about what PGAV does, who they are. And I really look forward to this conversation. So, Al, welcome. Hi, thanks. Welcome. Thank I appreciate you having me on. It's fun. You bet. Well, as I mentioned before, when we were talking previously on the phone, we haven't had the chance to have anyone on the the show so far that has a larger firm experience. So you're going to bring a new perspective that we haven't heard from before. Okay. I'll I'll try to do I'll try not to uh, indict the the large firms of. Uh, of architecture of the architecture world too badly. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Now, so tell us where you're located. Tell us a little bit about you know just who you are and where you're at. Okay, um, I live in I live and work in St. Louis, Missouri, um, the demographic uh, center of the United States of America, and um, the company PGAV. We have two offices: St. Louis and Kansas City. Historically, we've been in other places, but we're, we've settled on uh, leaving it with two offices. And um, um, so that's it. We are, we're, we're Midwestern guys, but the truth is we actually get all over the world. Uh, our work is international and uh, we're in Asia, we're in Europe uh, and all over North America. And what's the size of the firm? We have 125 people. We have about uh, a, roughly 80 in St. Louis and the remainder in Kansas City. So two offices, 120 people, and give us an idea of where you're doing, where your firm's doing work right now. You say you're doing some stuff internationally. Um, we have, uh, one, one of the things we happen to do includes entertainment design, what we call entertainment design or themed entertainment design, and that usually takes the, um, takes the form of theme parks, water parks, shows, rides, attractions, and so that marketplace, if you will, is, is really thriving in Asia. And so um, we uh, have multiple projects uh, in China, uh, Korea, and we are pursuing work in Singapore and uh, in other places in Asia. We have historically been um, kind of on a one project at a time, depending on the year, basis. We have uh, done work in Europe. Um, we have two theme parks who, that operate uh, in Spain. One of them is called Porta Ventura. It's actually the fourth most popular theme park in Europe. Uh, and we have just been recently contacted by, um, by someone who wants to do something in Germany. And it's actually an, an old trusted alliance uh, and they finally want to use us to, to help them develop a project. So maybe Germany. We've done quite a bit of planning work in South America over the years. It's never really amounted to uh, built work. Um, and we've toyed with the idea of pursuing work for the Olympics, um, but uh, that has not amounted to anything yet. And then we've worked in Canada, uh, in which that's a different country, so that counts as anything. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, the, uh, the Canadians would just, oh, they would hate us for saying that we even have to explain that, but, you know, us <laughs> Americans. <laughs> So uh, we've done quite a bit of work in and around Niagara Falls, uh, including um, uh, uh, an entertainment attraction that actually explains in an entertaining way um, the geology and the history of why the falls exist. Uh, it's called Niagara's Fury, and it is, um, it's in a, a thing called... Uh, Table Rock, which is actually a building that sits at a, on the, one of the promontories adjacent to the falls. It's very popular. It was a lot of fun to work on. We've done a lot of planning consultation in that area also, both to private developers and to the Queen Victoria Parks Commission, which is kind of an interesting, kind of an interesting client. And, and now we're consulting to uh, people on the American side and 
it looks as though we may get to do an exhibit uh, um, at the Tesla sculpture, the Nikola Tesla sculpture, which is actually on the American side. A lot of people don't realize that one of the great, one of the first really big hydroelectric, hydroelectric um, uh, power stations is at the falls. And it was designed by Nikola Tesla who is famous for the argument he had uh, with Edison over, over direct current versus alternating current. Uh, so anyway. Which he won, by the way, right? He did win, yes, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Tesla is uh, in the current uh, maker culture that is uh, rising again, is sort of experiencing a, a resurgence in popularity and sort of pop culture popularity. And so, and we have a bunch of Tesla nerds in our company who, who follow him and follow his life and are constantly, you know, wearing me out about it. But anyway, uh, it's going to be exciting to possibly get, possibly get to do uh, uh, an exhibit and a piece of architecture related to, uh, to Tesla's history. Now, Al, as a vice president, what are your specific job duties? What do you <laughs> do? <laughs> are you managing projects? Are you doing business development? Tell uh, us. Yep, I'm, uh, the people who lead our company have to do all those things. We are all fundamentally uh, seller doers, and um, so there's uh, six of us in St. Louis, and our job is to acquire the work, um, lead the work, which includes in varying degrees because each of us uh, each of us has a broad background, but a, course we're we're better at one thing than another um, so lead the work means in some cases literally design it uh, in other cases uh, just be the job captain if you will the, the job pusher um, execute the work you know produce it make sure that it gets done the right way and um, and that we don't get fired uh, <laughs> does that happen often <laughs> Uh, no, it's actually, it's against the rules where it's, it's against the rules to get fired. We're not supposed to get fired. Uh, and then make money, of course, you know, uh, it, to the extent that we can and then follow up. Uh, so, um, so we have a, a relatively flat structure in our company. We don't have very many levels. We like to not even acknowledge that there are levels. Um, and it's, it's not, it's a big company in, in some ways. You know, obviously, most architecture firms, they, I think, you know, aren't 90 percent of the of the architecture firms in North America, fewer than five people. So. So, yeah, in that context, we are a large firm, but it's not so big that we can't know everybody and that we can't um, uh, try to keep it relatively flat. I've worked in I've worked in a firm, a bigger firm that did have a kind of a matrix organization um, and we don't want to be that way. We, we want to be personal and we want to, um, you know, we, we have a lot of really good people who work here and we work very hard at making sure that those people fit in our company and we want those people to have fun every day, uh, to the, ex you know, in the context of the fact that we do business, you know, and that there is some work still, there is still drudgery and, you know, and, and, and difficult days, we pride ourselves on the fact that we, that we, we really do, we, we, we do our work in a fun way. Um, we actually like to think that our clients enjoy working with us and we, we work at that. We, we work at our clients having fun along the way. And I realize I sound like I'm selling me all of a sudden, but, but the point is the culture is really uh, personal. And um, so we don't want to have a lot of levels. Um, our, our leadership is deeply embedded in the projects that we do. And, um, and we, we, we organize our, our studio and our work around, around the projects. We, we don't have, um, you know, we pursue work in particular marketplaces, but, but we don't uh, have studios led by individual people. Um, when we get the work, we then decide who ought to, who best to do the work, and then we'll completely organize that project around the talent that we have, and vice versa. And so, 
So, so that's, well, that's that's a very that's a very I'll, I'll call it a high and noble concept of having uh, fewer levels. Uh, what how is that a applied how do you actually what's the real application of that what is that how do you apply that concept in your company yeah well there are a group of us who whose job it is to lead the projects and lead the company and we talk to ourselves to each other <laughs> we also sometimes talk to ourselves but uh, <laughs> but we talk to each other on a very regular basis it's it's not a standing meeting because we are because we travel a lot and so our our uh, um, our schedules are difficult to manipulate but we 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 talk to each other on an almost weekly basis and we we look at we look at every project and every opportunity and to ensure that it's it has the proper resources associated with it and that is the number one goal that we are doing the best job with the right people for each project at any one point in time. And then when we believe we have that solved, we then look at the people in our company to ensure that they are getting the right assignments and the right amount of exposure to the leaders of the company to the project types that we do so that they grow. And so, uh, and that's the primary way that we invest in our staff um, to ensure that their development is as led, is, is as well managed as we can do for them. You know, they, are the most uh, our people are the most important thing in our company I mean we have to have projects we have to have clients um, and we have to make things but we can't do any of that unless our people are doing their best work and are happy to be here and so so you know I, I'd like to tell you that we have some plan or some program but we're actually kind of anti-program we like to think we're very smart people uh, <laughs> and since it's just us talking to each other, who's going to argue, right? But uh, <laughs> but uh, so we so we invest heavily in the notion of let's make sure that the projects are properly staffed to the extent that we can. You know, we can't take one guy off of one project uh, just because we got another project. But then, are our people getting the best opportunities for their career along the way? And, and, and so uh, those are really the only, um, those are the, the only two topics in that, in that regular meeting where we talk about how we're doing and what we're doing. And it's as simple as that. Well, Al, you know, when I was originally, when we were talking about having you here on the show, there were a couple things that interested me particularly about you and your firm. One of them was the, the more interesting projects that you do, I guess that they're not as run-of-the-mill as some of the projects that most of us architects work on. <laughs> um, you know, I do healthcare now. Lots of architects do residential, commercial projects, and very there are very few firms out there that do theme parks. So I wanted to get your sort of get sort of figure out what that's all about, and um, and then also what well, like I said before your perspective as a as a vice president of a larger firm. So going, going to the theme park aspect, and I know you do some museum work and some theme parks. I have this book that I found at a bookstore. It's about the creation of Disneyland. Yeah. So forgive me for mentioning Disneyland. It's okay. <laughs> but it is one of my favorite books because you open it up there and the artwork in it is just incredible. The way these Sound people them. imagined and created this imaginary world just out of their minds. So the question I have for you is in your work and in the kind of theme parks that you do, how much artistic license do you guys have when you're coming up with these projects? And and before you answer that, sorry, give us a couple examples of the kind of projects you've done so people can have that in their mind. Yeah, sure. We, um, we are um, evolved from mainstream architecture. So in many ways, we are a lot like architect, you know, uh, classic architecture firms. And about six out of every 10 of us is in fact trained in the classical method, uh, you know, where we have, we have architecture degrees, we come from architectural programs. 
Um, and ultimately, even a theme park, and, and like you said, we do many things, theme parks are one of them, but a theme park is really a, just a little city, and it has office buildings in it, it has restaurants, you know, it has shops, it has, um, it happens to also include these sort of crazy other things, you know, roller coasters, uh, uh, shows, uh, attractions, um, and because we work for Bush Gardens and SeaWorld and some of the other major theme park developers in North America and the world, um, we, uh, we also happen to deal with uh, animal enclosures and animal exhibitry as a, regular, uh, as a regular event also. So we are not only unique to architecture in that we do themed entertainment, but we're also unique to themed entertainment in that we handle animals. And we're also unique to the zoo and aquarium world in that we handle entertainment. And so I'm super unique. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, but back to the original point, uh, you know, a lot of what we do every day still amounts to schematic design, design development, construction documentation, bidding, negotiation, um, construction administration. It, it, construction administration is unique in our world because we also do field-based art direction. So we have guys who are literally uh, um, sculptors uh, or uh, illustrators who happen to have, uh, have grown and become senior designers. And they will go to the field and put their work boots on and stand in the mud and, um, you know, reject the work and start over and stand alongside sculptors and, and painters in the field and, and art, literally art direct, which, which if we think obviously goes beyond construction administration in the standard, you know, AIA, uh, you know, uh, standard documentation. Uh, you know, we do field reports and we, we, we check, we certify uh, payment applications and all that stuff, but we, we do other things. So, so, so help me out. Help me out, Enoch, and remind me what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the artistic liberties you have when you're designing these projects. Is the the sky the limit? Well, it depends on the it depends on the um, it depends on the the role uh, the project. It depends on the the client, the assignment, and what we're trying to do. We like to believe that we understand how to create an entertainment product, not just accept an entertainment program and then execute it. Um, and so, yeah, there are times when the industry likes to refer to it as blue sky thinking. Uh, the Disney guys, and you, in particular Walt Disney Imagineering or Universal Parks and Resorts Creative, that's actually an entity inside their company. And then the clients we work for, where we would we actually play that role. Yes, there is there can be an early uh, product creation phase where perhaps you're not thinking about budget. Now we actually don't like to 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 be that way. We prefer to uh, to get after it, if you will, and <clears throat> we believe you can be wildly creative and open your mind to to the right solution uh, in any one project, but still be, and I hesitate to use the word realistic, but, but still realize that we have something to make here and that it's going to involve someone's resources and those resources have to be wisely, um, you know, we have to be the stewards of people's resources. And we take that, we take that role with care and precious, uh, uh, precious care. So when so, you're designing these, the creativity you have in the back of your mind, how much this is costing? Were our clients going to pay for this? Yeah, we never, we never don't think about that. But it doesn't mean we don't do some wild things. And, and yes, our drawings look like the very drawings in the book you referred to. We we do think, um, especially in the case of an individual entertainment attraction, we often think in storyboard format as opposed to first as opposed to plan section and elevation and i i like to pretend that we can imagine an experience and describe an experience in three dimensions before we draw the plan and and 
ultimately we can draw that plan and the section and the elevation because that's how you communicate with the in, the building industry and even sometimes your client but but yes in our projects we we do we do get the opportunity to think in that way and we are huge uh 3d visualization guys and i don't mean that we're bim guys we are um or uh sketchup guys we are but the point is we visualize first and we are capable of explaining a project to a client from the point of view of how their guest might see how they're going to experience that thing. You can call it experience design if you like. That's a new term. There, people like to use that. There are actually experience design curricula in American universities now, which I'm enthusiastic about. We even support a couple of them. But the point is experience first, plan section, and elevation second. So the answer to your question is, yeah, we love to think like that. We actually draw from industrial design uh, programs in America in addition to architecture schools because those guys are taught to illustrate first um, and then design and create and that's enormously valuable to us. Now, Al, you mentioned you mentioned that storytelling is a large part of what you do. Uh, what what have you learned from that process that you could share with other architects about telling stories sure, sure. when they present their projects? Sure. Um, I guess I feel like, you know, to me, architecture is about making places, making places for people. Uh, in, in, and we, you know, I went to Washington University in St. Louis, and we actually dabbled it when I went there, which is a, a gazillion years ago. We, we actually dabbled in what we now call experience design. And, and it sort of grappled with the idea of not only what does an individual place at an individual frozen moment in time feel like or look like, and I like to use the word feel like because I'm interested in the psychology of how people in particular enter a place and then how, how are they how are they moved by that initial moment? Not only what is it like to be there, work there, uh, um, be be uh, be healed there, but what's it like at that really golden moment when they arrive? And then, in addition to that, what's it like to move through a sequence or a series of places and have those moments occur in succession? And that's a story in a way, or it can be a story in a way in any building. And what, so is this something you'll present to the client? Do you actually have storyboards? Well, say this is the first yes, experience, this yes, is the yes, second experience. Yes, yes. It often before the plans ever get rolled out. My preference would be to always think think that way. But in the case of entertainment design, you have the additional opportunity to not only realize that you're manipulating a series of uh, a sequence of of experiences, moments, places, spaces, rooms, all those words apply, but you're also you also have the opportunity sometimes to add content, to add add entertainment content, to talk to the guest either through a character, uh, through uh, through an animal, um, or through uh, interpretive messaging, which of course, uh, in the case of our zoo and aquarium work, we're always doing. We're always talking to the guest about what should this stuff mean to you. And our particular bent is to avoid being didactic and preachy. And, and because we're entertainment guys, you know, we like to first grab our guests by the heart and uh, <laughs> toy with their emotions or manipulate their emotions. And it ultimately is a manipulation. You know, we're trying to put our put our guests in a place where where their feelings and emotions are in play. And then when we when we have them, when we hook them, you know, and hook is actually a story term, right? You got, you know, a movie always has a hook. You know, you got to, once I've got you, once I've set the hook, then I can kind of, you know, I can kind of take you, I can kind of take you where I want you to go. And the purpose of a story is to, is to either convey an emotion or to get you to think in a different way about a particular issue. Um, 
or to just make you happy uh, and to make you think about a, a, a particular thing in, in possibly a new way. So, yes, we are daily engaged with um, the application of story as it relates to uh, entertainment, um, um, interpretation of a particular institution's voice. You know, we talk like that with zoos all the time because they, they have something to say. Uh, but, it, but then in addition, pure architecture, just the, the joy and the meaning of, of, of that golden moment when you get to reveal to the guests what you, uh, what you had planned for them. And that sounds, that sounds a little, uh, a little more lofty and poetic than I had planned to be with you today, but uh, but I, I hope I'm getting at what you're asking me. You have. Now, you also mentioned in our previous conversation that you guys have innovated and looked for ways to change the way that, for instance, animals are viewed. And then you told me about something really cool that you guys are working on right now about, and I won't give away the secret, but hopefully you can remember what I'm talking to about, you know, this yeah, okay. So uh, tell us that story. <laughs> <laughs> That'll make sense once people hear it, yeah. Luckily, the firm has existed for a long time, and we've been uh, fortunate enough to be successful. Um, we have been around 45-plus uh, years now. I think, it's, I think we're on 40. I think we might be on year 48. Um, and so and we have worked in, in particular in the zoo and aquarium world for most of that time. And one of the things we've been um, along for the ride uh, on is the evolution of how people see uh, animals in, in animal exhibits. Um, and animals in human care have historically, you know, in the 60s and the early 70s, uh, in, in an aquarium or in a place like SeaWorld, or in a zoo, you, 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 you viewed, a, a human viewed an animal in, who was in the care of humans in a, in a, a, a relatively straightforward uh, enclosure. Uh, and it was either a cage or a, a blue pool uh, that happened to have very clean swimming pool-like water in it. <clears throat> and, and, of course, these are still great, wonderful uh, uh, institutions, but ultimately the guests sort of raise their hand and say, you know, we're not sure the animal is happy there. You know, they don't, they don't look happy. And, the, you know, the funny thing about that is our job as zoo designers or aquarium designers is certainly to ensure that the animal's welfare is intact. So you could argue that we're making the animal happy, but it's also to make the guests' welfare to be intact, and so we want the guests to be happy too. So we were part of a of a, a movement to uh, to change all that and to exhibit animals in their natural habitats and to allow the guests to be more fully immersed in what it's like to see the animal in their and in, in something closer to their more natural surroundings. Obviously, these things are all artificial in the pure sense of you know what that word means. It's it's man made. But uh, but it, it, but it's it's closer to the uh, immersing the guest in in a more uh, at least in a closer view of the natural environment, <clears throat> and then that allowed uh, the guest to get closer. And then what the guest was telling the industry was, well, now that we're closer, we don't want to feel the barrier anymore. We we see the barrier, we see that we see the animal, and now we sense the barrier. And we want the barrier to go away. We want to know what it's like to actually stand on the savanna with the cheetah. And, uh, and we, we still want to be safe. You know, we don't want the cheetah to kill us. But um, so we worked on that. And we realized what that really meant was the guests wanted to touch the animal. And so we got to do uh, some pretty remarkable work. There's a place in uh, it's owned by SeaWorld. It's in Orlando. And, and some of the people who are listening to this may have heard of it, it's a, it's a place called Discovery Cove where a guest can go and in the care and the safety of the world's best animal trainers, which are SeaWorld and Bush Gardens, they can actually get in the water and swim with Atlantic bottlenose dolphins. They can touch them, they can feed them, 
they can send them behaviors and get them to you know do the tail dance and the, and do the dorsal pull and it's very cool and then we realized that and, and we felt like we had created that product and it was a remarkable opportunity and and it's it, it's actually difficult not to get choked up about how wonderful that is and and it's an enormously wonderful experience it's a luxury experience it's kind of expensive it's three hundred and twenty dollars a uh, a person um, and it's wildly successful and the story there is people want to do it but then we we continued to learn and realize that okay there's another step to take and once we allowed the guest to touch the animal well now they want to be the animal so we we started to try to push that envelope and with storytelling and uh, experiential placemaking and ultimately entertainment um, we created uh, one, one of the most successful things we've done is, is actually a ride experience, a combination ride and aquarium experience at SeaWorld called Manta, where a guest can see the, see the story of what these animals are like and what they do in the wild, but they can also then feel what it's like to be a Manta, and they get on something called a flying coaster. So, so the, uh, you board the coaster, um, and then once you're in the harness, the, uh, the machine tilts you prone, you know, you go like this now, and then when you launch, you actually fly on your belly, uh, and then you do, you do these awesome, beautiful, exquisite maneuvers just like a manta does in, uh, underwater. They do this ballet in the wild, and, and uh, so... So the evolution of all this was see the animal, touch the animal, be the animal. And, and yes, PGV has had, has had the remarkable um, opportunity to sort of be along for the ride of all that. And of course, this all comes with uh, uh, technical expertise and, the, and architecture. You know, we have to know how much all that stuff costs. We have to know how to get those things built. We know how to. We have to know um, how to enclose those animals in that way, and um, and then we know we have to know how to tell that story and, un and unveil all that to to the people who come to see these wonderful experiences. And do you get into that process pretty deeply, or do you have consultants that you work with that help you design the aquariums and help you design the enclosures? Well, we. We are experts at, uh, um, we, we, we lead our projects, and we certainly have uh, consultants who come along with us, and some of them are trusted regular partners, because some of these things are obviously niche, uh, uh, niche expertise uh, places, but um, we, we are ride experts. And we are animal enclosure experts, and we are aquarium experts, and we like to believe that we are right there with uh, Escherich, Hamzi, Dodge, and Davis, and Peter Chermayev and Cambridge Seven. Well, we don't like to believe it. We are. We compete against them on a regular basis for major aquaria. We did the Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta with with TVS, but you know that's the world's largest indoor aquarium. So the answer to your question is, we certainly have certain expertise that we. We possess in-house, and then there are people along the way. Uh, lighting is a particularly important, um, <clears throat> uh, specific uh, consultant consultancy that that we don't have lighting design in-house. We think we understand lighting design, but to do an aquarium is a very important uh, and uh, difficult lighting task. And there are, uh, but, but we don't do that in-house. We use we, we pick from a group of people. And mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire protection, structure for rides, uh, and those are all, um, we have trusted partners that we like to go to. Let's move over to architectural education. Sure. Now, you, with the new fresh recruits that you're getting out of schools, are, in your opinion, are schools doing a good job of preparing architects for the profession? Well, um, some do and some don't, uh, and 
the profession is obviously a big thing and there are various roles one can play in the profession. Schools have, schools have a point of view. Um, I went to Washington University in St. Louis. Um, it, is, uh, it is a very design-oriented school. Uh, we like to, uh, we jokingly refer to it as doormat Ivy League. Uh, it, has a, it has a curriculum similar to um, uh, Brown and Harvard and Yale and Columbia. It's, but, um, and Bosch U has been, uh, uh, um, there are several distinguished alumni of Wash U, some of which graduated, some of which didn't. Uh, Charles Eames, for example, did not graduate from Washington University, although I've never figured out why. And one of the jokes was he got kicked out. But anyway, um, uh, uh, <laughs> Um, it's, a, it's a great school, but it is an extremely uh, design-oriented school, and the, the practical aspects of the curriculum are limited. Uh, and I say that even knowing that I, I would never trade my, my, design, my, my uh, educational career at WashU for anything. Um, but it's just so ha it just so happened that I worked through throughout college, and so I gained my practical knowledge on the boards. And so when I graduated, I was ready to go to work in any way that I could. It, it, I, I had lots of options when I graduated. I, I think that um, sometimes uh, schools that are overly design oriented uh, perhaps do uh, graduates a disservice. Be, and I don't think it costs anything to, um, I really don't think it costs anything to teach the practical aspects of building assembly and construction. And I don't see why we can't do a better job of that, regardless of the point of view of any one school. Now, we, in the Midwest, um, we draw from all over. We draw from the Southeast, the Southwest, um, New York, China. Uh, as it turns out, and and there are some great schools in the Midwest. The University of Illinois um, uh, does feed us. Washington University feeds us. Uh, Kansas Kansas State, Kansas University. Most of the graduates in St. Louis and Kansas City are actually graduates of K State and KU because the University of Missouri system does not have a an accredited uh, architecture program, and so. Uh, kids in Missouri and Kansas uh, uh, can attend both of those schools for state tuition. Now there are accredited schools, Wash U is accredited, uh, Drury is accredited, but um, so anyway that's a that's a bit of a tangent but but we draw from there. Arkansas has a great program and I love uh, graduates of Arkansas. Faye Jones used to teach at Arkansas because he lives in Fayetteville and that's where the school is. Um, and they have a great curriculum. Um, and Southern Illinois University Carbondale has a wonderful uh, program also. And, and they have a great mix of, of, of design and, uh, and practical, uh, practical uh, uh, education. So anyway, I'm kind of beating around the bush. But, you know, um, we have a tendency to look for really particular kinds of of graduates also well we're looking for kids who fit in our system and and well they the people who are looking for an alternative to mainstream architecture number one even though we do mainstream uh here you know we we want people who can move from one project to another seamlessly and so you have to want to do the kind of work we do so zoos aquarias museums uh exhibit design uh, science and technology, higher learning, and then themed entertainment. That's a pretty broad mix, but um, we want guys who can understand what it's like to take a storyboard and then turn that into a set of uh, working drawings. Okay, and that, and that is literally sometimes the assignment. The storyboard is the program. Okay, execute the project. And uh, so, and, and so we, and, and, like I said before, we invest heavily in our staff when we want our staff to stay here their entire career. Um, and so, you know, obviously we're not so bombastic as to think that every graduate that we hire will will do that. 
because it's just hard, you know, things happen, you know, your, your wife wants to move or, uh, or your husband or your, your, you know, your, your family has a, you, you, you or you, you want to pursue the tortured poet dream and your, you know, your, your professor calls from Finland and says, Hey, I've got a basement, a windowless basement in, in Norway, to, you know, and I'd love to have you do my work for you. You know, that that's happened to us. But, um, the point is, we invest heavily. We want we engender loyalty here, you know, and we reward we reward loyalty, and so that's a special kind of person. We we recruit. Uh, we go to Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, we go to University of Illinois. We do we go to both Kansases. Um, and what we have learned is that universities are now finding us. And I think this is something, this is perhaps a combination of um, necessity uh, and the last four years of the economy have taught architecture schools, we have a responsibility to try to place these, these graduates in, uh, in, um, in the workforce and it's become difficult. Uh, and so we have to find alternative methods. And so they've done a good job of reaching out and realizing firms like us exist. And there's nothing wrong with sending our graduates to places who, who 10 years ago, they might have said, you know, these guys who do this Disney stuff, you know, why this isn't, you know, we shouldn't send our kids there, you know. Um, well, that's different now. And, uh, and, and that's good. And we've reached out to them, and now they're and they found us, and it's it's working better. And we have found some uh, we we have found some some graduates who didn't know about us, who have been very positive about it, and ended up lasting here. And we've also found people who have found us in their sophomore, or their junior year in college, and they've stayed with it, and they've gotten a master's degree, and we've given them an internship, and it's worked out. And they got to pursue their dream of, of pursuing themed entertainment here. So it's working both ways now. So one thing I hear is sort of an undercurrent is that students need to seek out practical experience. Yes. And that yep. you probably look on that pretty highly when you're interviewing candidates if they've actually worked for firms and done. It, 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 it is immeasurably important. Uh, it makes you valuable day one, which you must be. You know, all we sell is time. And so as soon as we hire somebody, we start selling their time. The more valuable that time is immediately, then the more likely we are to want that person to work for us. And, and again, it does not diminish your potential for being a designer or being a creative. Um, you can still pursue your dream even if you spend some time in your career you know, uh, assembling working drawings or learning how to do construction administration or answering requests for information. That's part of your growth. It's, ne it's necessary. It makes you a better designer and all those things are important. But ultimately, ultimately the, the economics of architecture are really pretty simple. You know, schematic design is about 10 percent and design development is about 15 percent. And construction documents is 40%. You know, you can see where I'm going, okay? 10% of us at any one point in time are in schematic design. If, if more of us are working in schematic design, only two things are possible. Those people aren't being paid enough, and that's bad. Or the firm's losing money, and that's bad. So, so that's how it works. And, I, I, you know, so there. Since you talked about one of the purposes of, of this podcast and the business of architecture is to help architects increase the profit margin of their firms. So basically to pull out best practices out there so we can all rise up and sort of avoid the big calamities and sort of buffer ourselves against, you know, not making money. So what things have you seen in your role as at, at PGAV that have been helped you guys maintain a healthy profit and provide that oil to help us do what we need to do? Execute as well as you possibly can. Be a businessman or a business person. I'm, I'm not gender specific. Um, and differentiate yourself. Architects, God love us, 
and I do believe we pursue a noble thing. Um, listen to each other far more than we listen to other people in the world and far too much. Um, I, I believe that we should all talk to each other all the time, help each other as much as we possibly can, and listen closely to what, each of, what, what we are developing and innovating and driving toward in our professional pursuits. And then we should stop following each other blindly around and doing what each other does but instead, you know, do what we ought to do. Give me an example. When you say doing what each other does, give me an example to understand. In our case, I, yeah, it's a good question. In our case, um, I, I'll give you two examples. Um, on, the, on the simple, the sort of the, the, the mundane side, um, how many architecture firms have invested hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of dollars in software that the that the industry told them they had to do, have or that Autodesk told them that they had to have not to be uh, disrespectful I've, we, you know we we have uh, all the licenses that we're supposed to have from Autodesk um, but the point I'm glad is, we got that on the record by the yeah, way yeah exactly yes thank you <laughs> but on the other hand do you need it all or back in the old days when you had to upgrade AutoCAD in, in um, uh, versions, you know, uh, 2000, AutoCAD 2008, AutoCAD 2009, did you really need to buy, buy it new every year? You know, I watched an awful lot of firms waste an awful lot of money. And I don't mean waste in the sense that the, the, the program wasn't valuable, because it is. But be a business person. Think about that investment from the point of view of what are you going to get out of it and does it help you do a better job for your clients and create a better product? And if it doesn't, don't buy it. And I, I watched a really big firm year after year say if we just hadn't done all, spent all this money on expenses, we would have actually turned a profit this year. We broke even. But we got to buy all this stuff. And I raised my hand once at a meeting and said, why? And nobody had an answer. So first, and I know that sounds like, okay, I think architects are dumb. I don't think that. But question deeply. The second thing is differentiate. And we at PGAV, we like to believe we have expanded the services we provide. So do we do schematic design, design development, construction documents, construction administration? Yes, we do, but we, that's not all we do. We do creative writing. Uh, and uh, so, for example, to, uh, one of the projects we're enormously proud of is uh, Kennedy Space Center uh, Orbiter Home Project, where the world will go to see the Atlantis vehicle and see the story. There I am telling the story word again. Of, of that remarkable spaceship artifact in the context of architecture. But what we did there was we created a, uh, we helped a client get a job by being creative writers. So that was actually a, a, a competition uh, to uh, be given the opportunity to manage the Kennedy Space Center. It was a capital expenditure competition. So we did, the, we did the creative writing. We assisted in the creative writing of what the future of the Space Center ought to be. And then we did product development. We imagined what the new products at Kennedy Space Center should be. And then we did program management. We, we helped that client imagine how those expenditures should roll out over a 15-year period in a logical way that would grow, um, draw new attendance and create revenue for that client and grow. And then once we got the job, we did schematic design and design development and construction documents. So my point is we differentiate by creating different products. We, we extend what we do and we do things that other people don't do. And then we do them in the best way absolutely possible. And we are seen now as not only in certain niche industries, which I admit we work in, we're seen as storytellers. 
and product creation guys and creative guys, but we are also seen by those same people as delivery guys. In the, in the, in the entertainment world, the entertainment world is awash with architects who are highly creative, but who really would rather not take the project beyond schematic design. Well, we don't believe in that. We believe that we can be as creative as any one of those guys and do all the things you and I have had so much fun talking about today and deliver all the way to the end, right down to the nitty gritty and, and be there at the opening party buying everybody beers and saying, didn't we all do a great job? And then the next day be doing the post-occupancy evaluation and reevaluating what we did for those guys and getting paid to do all that stuff. So great delivery is a, is a way of, of distinguishing yourself from your peers and yes, you, you know, I, I, one of the things I think is very compelling and cool about the concept of your podcast is the notion of helping each other. And how can we be better businessmen? How can we make more money and earn a profit? And, but, but one of those things, one of, the, one of the ways is to face the fact that we all compete against each other. You know, so we can all admire our, each other and work toward being better colleagues. And I love that. And I think I'm, I'm genuinely enthusiastic about what you're trying to do with your podcast. But you have to face the fact that architecture is a business and business demands competition in the marketplace. And so you are personally trying to do better the thing you do than the guys you compete against. And you must face this. And I honestly think architects and artists in general struggle with that. And they want to believe that we that there's some level of nobility that somehow transcends whether we ought to have to do that. And it's it's to be blunt, that's dumb. Don't do that. You know, less lesson one is realize that we are competing and good competition is a noble pursuit. You know, drive your competition to be better at what they're doing by being better at what you're doing. Well, Al, it's been a great conversation. Did we leave anything out? Uh, I had notes. Uh, <laughs> fun time talking to you. Obviously, I, I can be a little verbose, and I appreciate you letting me run on and, and string multiple sentences together without interrupting me. But uh, I, did, I do mean, I meant what I just said. I, I do uh, support and endorse what you're trying to do with your podcast. I think it's a very cool thing. Keep, keep it up. Keep doing it. And stay in touch with me. I, I, uh, I'd like to do that. Oh, we will. And where can people find you to connect with you? You're on Twitter, any of the social media sites? Uh, sure. Um, t- Twitter, uh, my Twitter handle is um, at Al Cross Jr. Um, but we also, the company uh, is at spot underscore the underscore zebra, at spot the zebra with the underscores in the right place. Uh, we have a mascot who is a multicolored zebra. And so find at Spot the Zebra on, the, on, on Twitter, and that's kind of how you watch our company. And then, of course, we're on the web, uh, www.pgavdestinations.com. Well, enjoy the rest, and this is a Friday. Enjoy your weekend, Al, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, thanks again, Enoch. You, uh, you've got a cool thing going. Keep it up. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Well, that's it for today. If you like this video, please share it by clicking one of the share buttons. And to get updates when I post a new article, video, or podcast, visit businessofarchitecture.com, sign up for our email list, and I'll send you my exclusive ebook, Social Media for Architects. Everybody.